we come to the letter to the Ephesians for a third time, for a third week in a row. We find ourselves right at about the halfway point in the letter. If you broke it up into two volumes or even two sermons, the first one would end right here. It would be wrapped up quite nicely, in fact. For the first three chapters of the letter, Paul, or perhaps someone writing in ways that are undeniably influenced by Paul and his theology, has offered deep understandings about the nature of the work of God in the world through Jesus. He has talked about the gifts that come to us by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He says that through Christ, God has adopted us as children of God. Through Christ, God has given us redemption and forgiveness of sins. Through Christ, God has given us an identity and an inheritance that cannot be taken away. Through Christ, God has pulled back the curtain to reveal God's plans for the world that were going on from the beginning of time that includes bringing all things, things on heaven and earth, back to God's self. Through Christ, we have a hope for this life and the next that cannot be taken away. He goes on to say that through Christ, God is tearing down the dividing walls that have separated people since the beginning of time. It starts by breaking down the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles, but we could extend it to all divided groups in all times, including our own. God is taking this house that humanity has built and demolishing it. God is taking a wrecking ball to the entire thing through Christ and building something far greater. God is setting Christ as the cornerstone of the foundation of the house that God is building. And because it will be built with all people of faith, when God is finished with it, it will be a dwelling place in which God is proud to live. So for about two and a half chapters, Paul has proclaimed the incredible work of God. It is divine work with divine ends that could only be accomplished by God. And it is good news for all people in all times. Paul recognizes that this is a power that is reshaping the world, and he is getting to watch it happen. No one is being left out. God is working to unite all of humanity in one family, and Paul is absolutely in awe of it. He is so amazed and he is so inspired that Paul is driven to his knees. He is moved to a place of worship, a place of reverent prayer before the one who is doing this incredible thing in the world. He's humbled and grateful that he gets to be part of it. And his heart is praying prayers of thanks and blessing to God. But he is also praying for those who are reading and hearing these words. You know, I think this is one of Paul's most brilliant pastoral moments. He bears his soul in this letter to those who will read it and hear it. He shares his hopes and his prayers for the ways the power of God might be at work through Christ and might take root in the hearts of the lives of those in Ephesus. He wants them to know that because of all that he has come to understand through God, through Christ, that there are certain hopes and dreams and prayers that he has for the people as they live out their faith together. And this is what he says from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. As I read these words, listen for a good word from the Lord. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The soil in which you plant something matters, and any gardener will tell you about their plans. It isn't just about the amount of sun or rain, and it's not just about the condition of the seed itself either. If the soil isn't good, the plant's roots won't absorb the nutrients that the plant needs to thrive. The soil needs to be fertile, 
It needs to be rich in nutrients that will feed the plant and help it grow. Anyone that has ever tried to grow something gets this. It is why images of plants and roots and soil are found throughout the Bible and why those images still speak to so many people today. It is pretty universally understood that the nature of the soil in which you plant something matters. And sometimes you have to take stock of what is in your soil and what's missing. As you are planting your garden, it may be beneficial to take a sample of the soil, send it off to a university agricultural department so that they can analyze it. And they'll send you back a report with what you need to insert into the soil in order to help the plant grow. Or they offer a suggestion perhaps as to whether it might be better to consider planting in different soil altogether. Well, when it comes to the living, breathing, growing organism of the church, and each of the individual Christ followers that makes up the body of Christ. Paul says that there is only one place that we can be rooted and grounded if we want to thrive, the love of Christ. This is powerful. It is extravagant. It is for the entire world and no one is left out. It shapes who we are as children of God and it has the power to shape the ways that we relate to one another in the church and the ways we relate to the world at large as well. The love of Christ. It has the power to heal our hearts, minds, and souls. It has the power to call us back to God who believes that we can, in us instead of who we believe we are or who the world tries to tell us who we are. It enables us to let go of the hate we feel toward our perceived enemies and to embrace forgiveness for ourselves and for those who may have wronged us. The love of Christ. It enables us to take part in the healing of the world by looking beyond our own concerns and embracing compassion for those we come across who are in need. It empowers us to speak up for the voiceless, to ensure that others claim their own agency, to work for justice for those to whom it has been denied, and to care for those that society has deemed the last, the lost, and the least. Only by being rooted and grounded in the love of Christ will we find what we need to be who we are called to be. The problem is that we may find ourselves rooted and grounded in other things. We may find that our soil is made up of something other than the love of Christ. Being rooted and grounded in the love of Christ will enable you to live life to the full. Being rooted and grounded in anything else may end up stealing your life. More often than not, if we aren't rooted and grounded in love, we may find that we are rooted and grounded in soil made up of what may be its opposite. Well, if it's not its opposite, it's certainly somewhere on the other end of the spectrum. Fear. If you are rooted in fear, then your roots will absorb the things of fear. Everything and everyone around you will be perceived as a threat to you, to those you love, and to your collective well-being. If you are rooted in fear, then your first instinct isn't going to be to lean toward treating others with hospitality and compassion. It's going to be to lean toward focusing on your own security and survival. Your instincts won't move toward generosity and good stewardship of the resources at your disposal out of the recognition that you are living into the abundance of God. Instead, your instincts will lead you toward a scarcity mindset that makes you want to hoard as much as you can and risk as little as possible because you never know when it just might all be gone. If you are rooted in fear, your instincts won't lead you to a place where you can love your enemies and bless those who persecute you as Jesus instructed. Instead, your instincts will lead you to a place where you hate everyone who isn't like you. It will lead you to a place where it will feel like anyone who isn't on your side of the latest issue may be against you on everything. If you are rooted in fear, then instead of forgiveness, you will embrace retaliation. If you are rooted in fear, then you won't be able to embrace an understanding of Sabbath because it will feel like wasted time. You will want to spend as much time and energy as possible producing because who knows how much time you have left and you will miss out on the most important parts of life and may risk working yourself to death. If you are rooted in fear, it will simply hinder your life and your relationships 
It will take away purpose and meaning. It will be impossible to live life to the full. It will be impossible for you to thrive. But rooting yourself in the love of Christ, on the other hand, will absolutely set you free. The chains and shackles that fear has put on you will be taken off. Those who once felt like a threat to you no longer will because their power over you will be taken away or because you will recognize those places of hurt within them that makes them do whatever it is that once felt like a threat to you. Or you will finally see that they are children of God who are worthy of love and capable of loving. It won't matter what they say about you or do to you because you will know the love of the one who knows your identity better than anyone else who sees more potential in your ability to contribute to the improvement of the world than anyone. If you are rooted in the love of Christ, then you will see that the old wars over who is in and who is out are meaningless because God wants to bring all people together in one family. If you are rooted in the love of Christ, then your eyes are going to be opened to the abundance of God's provision for us all generosity becomes incredibly possible because you recognize that there is always enough for everyone. Stewardship is possible because you know that nothing that you have is truly yours anyway. It is simply yours to watch over and pass on for the good of someone else. If you are rooted in the love of Christ, then your life's purpose and meaning will finally become available to you because you will find yourself swept into the mission of Christ for the world. If you are rooted in the love of Christ, then your potential will be unlocked and you will find fulfillment living it out each day. Paul wants the Ephesians, he wants us all, to be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. That is the only way we'll become who God is calling us to be. But his message isn't simply for individual believers. It may start there. But Paul is writing, as he most often did in the letters that we have in the New Testament, to a community of believers. In order to be rooted and grounded in love, we need to be with others who are rooted and grounded in the same soil. Paul calls them saints. It is incredibly difficult to stay rooted and grounded in the love of God when you are alone. We have all learned that during this ongoing pandemic. And it is what raises the anxiety levels for so many of us when we see rising case numbers because we don't want to go back to that place of isolation and loneliness again. We crave being in community with one another, at least in part in the church, because we know that we experience the love of Christ in unique ways when we are in community with one another that we never can when we are completely on our own. We can open our hearts and allow the Spirit of Christ to take root in us as individuals, but we feel the Spirit at work even more clearly when we are in some community with one another. The community of faith is where we see and feel the power of Christ's love most abundantly. In faith community, we're given the gift of people who truly care for us. They ask how we're doing, and it isn't some perfunctory greeting. They actually want to know they want to know the things that are going on in our lives, both the things that we can celebrate together and the challenges that we are facing. They ask how they can pray for us, and then they actually pray for us. They pray for healing and growth in areas where it is needed. They pray for strength to endure the pains of life. They pray for comfort and peace in times of heartache and loss, and each prayer is made out of a genuine sense of concern and love but then they go even further. They put their prayers into action. They open themselves up to being used by God to care for us. So they drop what they are doing when a need presents itself and they help in any way that they can. When we live in faith community with others, the deepest sense of our identity as a child of God is affirmed. It starts at times of dedication, when we claim a child and a family as our own in the community of faith, and we bless them. It happens again at baptisms, when we claim each other as brother and sister in Christ. It happens when we greet each other in worship with the peace of Christ, and when we affirm the callings to positions of service and leadership. It happens each time we come to the Lord's table, 
and are reminded that the bread of life and the cup of the new covenant are for each of us. But even more than the moments sealed in ritual, it happens when we sit across the table from each other and we break bread together and we make room for the other person to be all of who God has made them to be. It happens when we offer the gift of space to each other to study, to learn, to question, and to wrestle with the way God may be speaking to each of us in each moment. It happens when we find ourselves wrapped up in a greater cause than our individual lives, or even our own small community of faith. It happens when we roll up our sleeves, when we get to work together, making the world around us a little bit better and a little bit more like heaven. It happens when we are able to completely open ourselves and to be completely honest with each other. We can be completely open and honest with one another because we know that when we are, we won't be met with judgment and ridicule. We will be met with empathy and, when necessary, forgiveness. These are things that we can't simply figure out on our own. They have to be experienced in some community with one another, a community rooted in the love of Christ. But sometimes even faith communities can be rooted in something other than the love of Christ. Instead of a Christ-like love that leads to openness and acceptance of everyone on the journey, the temptation may be to seek closed communities or theological purity and cultural control. Instead of a Christ-like love that sends us out on mission, we can become concerned most with institutional preservation. Instead of praying for a deepening of the spirit that's connecting us all and forming us all into better disciples, we can become concerned solely with numerical growth that helps us pay the bills. Instead of being willing to step out on faith to live into the vision Christ has for us, we can become most concerned with meeting our own desires for stability and for our comfort, and even for just keeping everyone happy. With that in mind, the prayer that Paul expresses for the Ephesians becomes the prayer of every congregational leader everywhere. That each person in the community would know that they are loved no matter what. That the love Christ has for each of them would lead them to get to know one another. To truly love each other. That those who have been part of the community longer than others would take the lead in the way that we are taking the first steps towards those who might be newer. They would ask what gifts that they have that could lead the community and what experiences and lessons that they bring that would allow us all to grow closer to God. The prayer would be that we would all come to a place that we were so sure of Christ's love for us that it would lead us to a place where we could get beyond ourselves, to a place where we can finally serve others, where we wouldn't need to focus on what we want or what makes us comfortable but that we would focus on what sacrifices we could make to help others feel welcomed and loved among us and in our world. Where we would remember that the entire purpose of the church is to have an impact on the world around us. That is, after all, how we thrive together, by impacting the world around us. As we continue to emerge and dream about a time beyond COVID-19, we each have a chance to analyze the soil in which we are rooted. We do collectively as a community of faith as well. I told our deacons a few weeks ago that we would never have asked for a pandemic, especially one that has taken so many lives, including lives in our own congregations and in our own extended families. At the same time, any community of faith like ours often needs some catalytic event, something that forces us to stop what we have always been doing and to take stock to ask what works and what doesn't so that we can determine what we should be doing, to ask where we are truly rooted and grounded in the love of Christ and where we have mistakenly rooted ourselves in some other type of soil. In a way, we are a church that is being replanted right now. We have a new opportunity to place our roots in the love of Christ, or we have an opportunity to place our roots in Christ in new ways. Church as it once was may not be what is needed for the future. We may need to see ourselves as part of God's story in new ways. You know, each of us, and collectively as a community of faith, we're uniquely suited in our community. And we're uniquely gifted within our congregation for impacting the world around us with the love of Christ. 
Together, we are at the intersection of the church and the community. And as we form in our faith, we are being called to notice the obstacles that prevent others from living life to the full and to look within ourselves to determine how we might be uniquely suited to remove those obstacles and to empower all people to live abundant life on Christ's terms. If our community of faith, both in person and online, is truly rooted in the love of Christ, then we will not only recognize it in the ways that we feel this community's impact on our lives, we have always felt that, but even more than that, we will recognize it in the way that God has used even a community of faith like ours to impact the world. As we all experience that together, we may at last begin to grasp the height and depth and power of the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. So now to him, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.